midst towers a black and restless sky. The horned one rests in nature's bier. Heeds not our death lament nor cry, awaiting star child's light and fire. The task complete and work well done, Earth's crawling creatures shown the way to progress through the mill of life, emerging better for the play. One cycle o'er with more to come, break chains that bind to present form. With karma purged and new life won and rebirth through the gate of horn. The Rite of Capricornus to be performed when the sun has been reborn through the horns of Capricornus. One aspect of Capricornus and its ruler of Saturn is that of time and age and the knowledge that we, as humans, occupy a mere fraction of eternity from birth to death. Yet we birth at the winter solstice, we have the regeneration of the sun, which speaks most forcibly of rebirth and renewal. Look back on your past with its successes, failures, hopes and mistakes. Certain landmarks will stand out as peaks of victory, others as deep valleys of sorrow and despair. But the soul continues climbing to the top of the mountain. Joy and sorrow are the two sides of the same coin, and we must learn to greet them both with a modicum of reserve. Recognize the impermanence of situations, and know that all things must eventually pass away. A philosophical attitude to life needs to be nurtured even when we are in the midst of happiness and enjoying it to the full as we should the higher self will be aware that all experience is but a learning process capricornus is concerned with many things and one of them is the sanctity of the earth in ancient times the earth was revered as a mother goddess on whose breast we were sustained and in whose loving arms we were received at our death. This primordial concept was worldwide and is being renewed in the present day. More and more people are appreciating the need to protect the earth and everything upon it at the time of its greatest peril. Already it has been suggested that the earth is a living entity in its own right, a great organism which is self-controlling, sustaining and regulating both its own life and those of the tiny organisms that live upon its surface. Certain unorthodox scientists are the founders of this revolutionary theory and have named it the Gaia hypothesis. After Gaia, the earth mother of ancient Greece. Of course, this theory is diametrically opposed to the commonly accepted idea, namely that life occurred because conditions were conducive to its coming into being. Certainly to live and exist in harmony with Gaia is of the greatest importance. Since time began, there have been rituals and festivals to this end because we knew instinctively that we must in some way make recompense for the miracle. This we did, first with human or animal sacrifices and later, as we developed, with the ritual of returning sheaves of corn and libations of wine to the mother of all living. From the smallest village custom to the great fire festivals of the pagans and the witches, the nature year has been observed, marked and acknowledged throughout history down to the present day. And by sanctifying nature in this manner, 
we also sanctify and purify ourselves. And now, gaze at the aura of the candle flame. Gradually your eyes close and you awaken in your visualization on the inner plane. You are sitting in the entrance of a small cave and it is very cold. Outside the snow is falling in large thick flakes onto an already white carpet that stretches into the distance. It is difficult to see anything clearly but you sense the immense tranquility of this place. Nothing happens, so you stand up and notice a woolen robe at your feet. Thankfully, you don the warm garment, pulling the hood over your head and securing the robe with a rope girdle. You also discover a pair of soft lined boots and sink your feet into them with a sigh of relief. Thus arrayed, you step out into the snowy landscape and peer around. As you stand there, you hear the faint sound of cowbells and presently glimpse a long, thin line of bobbing lights moving slowly in your direction. As they approach, you can just make out that the lights are lanterns held aloft on poles by a company of hooded figures. Animals in the form of yaks bear bundles on their backs and accompany the procession. They pass by, walking steadily, without speaking or acknowledging your presence. You decide to follow at a discreet distance, but find it quite difficult to keep up with them, despite the ready-made path in the snow. Your quickened breath hangs vaporized in the cold air as you struggle along in the footsteps of these travelers. Soon there is a definite though gradual ascent leading to a range of dark mountains which rise into jagged peaks. You long to sit down in the snow and rest but resist the impulse and push on with grim determination. Now you are in the shelter of the rock face and find that the lights have gone. Hurrying, you see the tracks disappear into an opening, a narrow fissure that runs through the sheer sides of the living rock. Here a flickering light can be seen somewhere ahead and walking is easier. At last you emerge under a clear star bright sky. The scene before you is bathed in moonlight and makes you catch your breath. You have come to a valley protected by the mountains. The short turf is starred with flowers that grow everywhere, climbing the rocks and peeping over high ledges. A stream runs chuckling and bubbling through this valley, and you can discern the goat-like chamois leaping agilely amongst the cracks and perching confidently on tiny protuberances.
The valley is alive with chanting voices. The procession you followed is only one of many. From every direction moves lines of Buddhist monks, their lanterns creating a fairyland vista of twinkling lights. All the monks are making their way to a temple situated in the center of the valley. You can hear the deep reverberations of a gong hanging in the still air near the temple. Slowly you begin to walk in the same direction, drawn to this mysterious place. One by one the monks enter the sacred precinct of the temple first tethering the animals to convenient posts and removing their footwear. The heavy aroma of incense is powerful as you move to look inside the building. It is ablaze with light from hundreds of candles. In your turn you climb the steps and dutifully leave your boots on the terrace with all the others. Many hundreds of monks are gradually filling the vast interior of the temple. They seat themselves facing the statue of a gigantic golden Buddha, which reposes in the customary lotus position a slight enigmatic smile upon its features. You sit down with the assembly, cross-legged and in the lotus position, if you can manage it. Almost immediately, you are calm and attentive to the atmosphere which is charged with spiritual power. The chanting continues and the smoke from the incense curls upwards in never-ending spirals. In spite of the number present, it is comfortably cool within the temple. And quite suddenly, you realize that this vast assembly is meditating upon the whole of humanity. The thoughts of these monks are being concentrated into one great effort in order to bring more harmony into the world. In a sense, it is as though they are acting as nurse to the earth by sending forth rays of comfort and healing to our planet and to the life upon it. You willingly join with them in this work. Soon a cone of golden radiance builds above the statue of the Buddha. It glows ever brighter until a perfect pyramid of white luminosity hovers in the air. Abruptly, the chanting ceases and the shining cone vanishes as though plucked out of existence. The power has been transmuted. Now the atmosphere is flat and ordinary and the monks slowly file out of the temple. You feel a tug at your sleeve and one of the monks smiles and beckons. You retrieve your footwear and follow him, breathing the fresh mountain air and watching the newborn suns first rays creeping over the grass.
Crossing the stream by way of large stones set strategically in the fast flowing water, your companion makes for the opposite cliffs and the dark opening of a cave. He turns and smiles reassuringly, then dives into the entrance. Inside, you traverse a passage lit by flaring torches, and soon daylight shows again. The monk indicates that you are to proceed alone, then bows and is gone. In front of you, the landscape is green and flat with circular huts dotted here and there. Several well-worn paths meander through the long grass and the only visible movement is lazy smoke curling from the tops of the huts. You notice that some areas of the land are surrounded by rough fences made from thin slices of wood bound together with reeds. Away to the right, a gleam of water reveals a marshy tract. So you choose a path that skirts the huts and walk quietly along in the early morning sun. Small stones are spaced at intervals along this path. They are covered with many diverse symbols, such as butterflies, trees, pillars, and magical signs that include a triangle painted blue. The path twists and turns upon itself only to resume its original direction further on. Now the huts are left behind and you are approaching two stone pillars carved with breast-like cupolas that stand before an enclosure which is protected by a low stone wall. You walk between the pillars, aware that you have entered a sacred place, and also aware that this is one of the most solitary journeys you have taken. But now, the gentle lowing of cattle is heard, and there, in the centre of the enclosure, stands a large round byre. The bright eyes of calves peep through the sturdy reed-woven walls, but your attention is riveted by the stone figure which stands at the doors of the byre. The mother goddess sits with a child half animal, half human, at her breast and regards you steadily with the hint of a smile curving her lips. Her hair is dressed in a high standing style topped by a crown of gleaming jet. Both the goddess and her child wear necklaces of pearly white globular beads. In front of the byre, a great crescent of white stones extends like embracing arms. This is the gate of Horn, denoting sacred land where gods and men unite.
a rustling turns your head, just in time to glimpse someone disappearing behind one of the pillars. A basket of food has been brought for you. Thankfully, you sit down in the shelter of the wall and tuck into coarse bread and figs, quenching your thirst from two stone jugs, one containing water and the other milk. Even though this is one of the loneliest journeys, it appears that you are watched over. Then something else happens. The stillness is broken in a most agreeable manner by the thin fluting of pipes, a melody haunting and sweet. And there, sitting nonchalantly on the wall of the enclosure, is the unmistakable figure of Pan. With pipes at his lips and shaggy goat foot limbs at ease, the god of all nature caresses the reeds with nimble fingers. Slanting amber eyes gaze over the grasslands, his heritage, his by right, as keeper and shepherd of the wild things. The great god Pan keeps you company while you rest. Then Raising a hand in farewell, he leaps from the wall and is gone. You save some bread and liquid as an offering to the goddess and approach the statue. You scatter crumbs and as a libation pour the remains of the water and the milk onto the ground. She is very lifelike and you are comforted by her presence here. The goddess broods over the land and seems to lend contentment to the animals within their enclosure, which apart from an occasional bleat and snuffle, are quiet and at peace in their environment. You look up into the strange bird-like eyes this stone carving of a mother and child externalizes our oldest ideas of divinity, embracing the concept of earth as mother and nurse, the source of all creation. You put out your hands and touch the cool knees, huge and rounded. A feeling of calm steals over you and sitting down you rest your head at the mother's feet you can hear your heartbeat thudding in your ears boom 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 the sound fills your consciousness like a muffled drum but is it your heart or something else? Boom, boom, boom. It creates an hypnotic effect, quieting, but at the same time, disturbing. You become aware of a presence. Opening your eyes, you are confronted by someone in a filmy gray robe. The figure stands near you, a swathing of the gauze-like material concealing the features. It emits strong, benign rays of power, which are almost tangible. Raising its arms, the filmy robe shimmers with starlight, as though the material had transformed into a night sky. Slowly, you are drawn into its folds and lifted into the air. In 
no time at all, you can feel the earth again beneath your feet. A dark sloping tunnel opens in front of you, and a light from occasional flares reveal the grey rope figure somewhere ahead. The ground is very uneven, and a strong smell of dank earth mixed with the odour of dried blood becomes more intense with every uncertain step you take. At one point, water gushes from a cavity and accompanies you, running down a groove on one side of the tunnel. At last, you stumble into a huge cave where the blackness is held at bay by more torches, secured to the walls. Here, the smell of blood and decay is overpowering. The floor of the cave is strewn with bleached bones and bits of animal skins. And across at the far side stands a gigantic figure carved from the living rock and still attached to it at the back. The naked woman is blackened by smoke and smeared with the blood of many sacrifices. She is seated with hands folded across her belly, but the head of the woman is wreathed in darkness where the flickering flares cannot reach. More primitive and coarse than the goddess of the byre, she exudes a primeval force which fills the whole cave and gives a feeling of apprehension. The place is crowded with the astral shells of dead animals. A dreadful place, indeed. The grey-robed figure is standing at the side of the statue, and her presence is reassuring. But if only someone would speak! I will speak to you now. The figure draws back its veil to reveal the face of an old, old woman. Yet the voice gives no indication of old age. The sign of Capricornus is one of brooding silence, of darkness before the dawn, and death before rebirth. It is of the rocks and the dark reaches of space whence all life comes. Its essence is time, which each life form views in a different and special way. Ranging from the butterfly, whose lifespan is one or two days, to that of a star, which can be millions of years. In the end, time is irrelevant, of interest only to the manifest world. The lifespan of your world is governed by Saturn, who is known as Father Time, and sometimes Death. You have some knowledge of that gentleman, but he merely regulates and measures the ratio of energy and atoms, whether in or out of manifestation. There is really nothing frightening in all this. Energy in the form of light can never be destroyed. And so it is with souls or sparks from the ineffable Godhead. My name is Hecate, and this is my province. I guide lost souls and bring all to the mother, of whom I am an aspect. You have seen the fertile mother with her animals, but now you are looking upon black Isis, 
one of the earliest concepts of the goddess. This sanctuary was made in her honor, and the life she gave so willingly was returned at certain times as a thanksgiving for that fertility. It was the highest form of worship and the most selfless. Black Isis is the giver of dynamic force, the primordial essence whence life itself began. You look again at the crude sensual carving, the streak of soot lying across the heavy breasts, the great thighs set slightly apart, and the vast belly holding new life. You begin to tremble, and your heart goes out to that venerable giantess. Then the strange thing occurs. The beating, as of a great heart, begins again and fills the cave as though it were the body of a living being. With each thud, an answering flood of life force pervades your body until you can bear it no longer. And stumbling forward, you fall against the statue, your arms reaching out to clasp the huge limbs. Your tears darken the stone and trickle down the slab-like legs. Here, in the womb of the earth, communing with the fructifying powers of nature, a great peace envelops you. It is time to go. The voice of Hecate intrudes. Straightening up, you gasp at her appearance. Gone are the wrinkles and the grey straggly hair. They have been replaced by a smooth milky complexion and honey-coloured tresses cascading about her shoulders. A gentle smile touches the full red lips. Everything is change, says she. I may be young or old as I please. Now you see me as the young moon. She beckons with a slender white hand and disappears through a narrow fissure in the rock. You follow with a last glance at Black Isis. Another passage is negotiated which eventually leads to a series of caves. The atmosphere becomes steadily colder until you can see an entrance and the falling snow outside. I have brought you back to where you began this journey. I will always be near at hand. 
the goddess opens her arms and embraces you. Be brave and continue upon the path and come back soon. The goddess waits while you take off the warm robe and the boots. Then, as you sit down, the scene gradually fades. When you open your eyes again, you are in the familiar surroundings where you began the journey of Capricornus.